So, good morning to all of you. Is the microphone working? It seems that it is. Okay, um, I'm supposed to give you a kind of an introduction about atmospheric uh, chemistry modeling and, and transport modeling. Perhaps before I start, I would like to know, maybe you could raise your hand, who is running models here around? Who? So it's quite a few people. And maybe who is not running a model? So it's a minority, but it's still quite a few people. So what I would like to try to do is to uh, highlight a bit what models are doing. It would be an introduction, so maybe a lot of you will know already a lot of that. We'll try to think a bit about what a model is, because what I realize is that a lot of people, not here, but outside, when you talk to model results, people do not necessarily understand exactly what a model is. We'll look at some chemical transport models in particular. We'll go through the fundamental equations quickly, and then we'll talk about how to model the chemistry, the chemical processes, how to model the transport, and how to model the exchanges with the surface. Now, we will not do that all in one hour. Um, this is for two hours. But also, the more technical aspect, I might go very, very quickly about them. And then, for those who are coming to the working group, we go, might go back on some of the more numerical uh, aspect. So uh, there is a book in preparation uh, that Daniel Jacob and myself are putting together. It is uh, available, most of the chapters, not all of them yet, on a website that is uh, there. It is password, password protected, but the password is also indicated here so you can go through and see some of the chapters that will take some of the details, in particular the numerical details. Okay, let's start with the problem. What, what do we want to do when we develop models? And of course, we know that there are observations, observations of chemical species, for example, from space that some of you are looking at. They really reveal the complexity of the problem. Uh, the spatial distribution of the chemicals is determined by uh, emissions, chemical transporta uh, transformation, uh, transport, but transport at different scales, changes of phases, some getting into uh, gas and then from gas to liquid or, or particles. Um, I mentioned multi-scale transport processes, wet scavenging if you have clouds and rain like here today or a dry deposition. And so mathematical models of the chemical composition needs to capture all these processes at once and try to simulate how they affect the chemical composition and the concentration of a species. Well, here are some of the satellite observations. This is now ozone in the stratosphere and the formation of the ozone hole that you uh, recognize. This is an observation uh, in 2006 and you see the complexity because in the middle you have a lot of ozone that's clearly chemistry but outside you see how the transport uh, tries to uh, change the concentration at any point of the atmosphere. If we look at other gases like methane for example we see that uh, the emissions are probably changing quite dramatically as a function of the year and so the exchanges with the surface are also very important. If we look at carbon monoxide that is uh, produced partly from emissions but also photochemically, we see here for example the importance of biomass burning in the tropics as well as like now for example in the winter time high concentration associated with industrial emissions. So all that needs to be there. More complicated are things like BRO in the troposphere which are produced probably by um, kind of ice flowers, snow flowers that you see in the Arctic and a kind of a mechanism that remove uh, halogen and bromine in particular from the ice when the sun is back in the uh, spring and so this is as you see in, uh, in spring more or less. 
Uh, there are other examples that we could show. These are observations of uh, NO2 from satellite showing the very detailed structure of chemicals like uh, short-lived species like NO2, also highlighting the need for relatively high resolution, spatial resolution. You have, if you really want to do a good job, you have to look at the size of a city, for example, to see where the emissions are and what happens to uh, NO2. Other compounds, intermediates now, like uh, formaldehyde, are being, being measured by space. And you see here again, for example, the important role of the tropics as uh, where precursors of formaldehyde are uh, released. So let's now say, okay, we have, we see the complexity, we see the distribution, we see the time evolution of those compounds. So we would like to capture them in, in a model. But what is exactly a model? And so we can think, of course, much about a definition. And perhaps a model is, generally speaking, a representation of a part of the universe in which we live. This is a very general uh, statement. But our brain makes models all the time. When you cross the street, you see a car coming, you kind of calculate if you still have time to cross the street before the car comes. You do affect, in fact, a model, and hopefully you do a good model in this case. But uh, it's clear that a model does not necessarily capture the whole complexity of the system. When you cross the street, you, you don't care about uh, other problems. You focus on something. You might, might be even sometimes subjective when you develop a model because you want to highlight a number of aspects that you think are important. Now, physical models can be viewed of mathematical representation of the fundamental law that govern the Earth. And these laws are, of course, uh, well known. For example, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, evolution of the uh, momentum. So model can generate knowledge, but in fact, they generate knowledge not by creating themselves new concepts. There is nothing in the model that you have not told the model to do. Sometimes we say junk in, junk out. Uh, but in reality, uh, you will not develop new, new concepts, but you will assemble a lot of observations or a lot of uh, knowledge and really try to put it together in a much more comprehensive uh, manner than uh, your brain can do, uh, for example. And so these models can, do then, can be used as diagnostic tools. You can try to understand with these models what you observe and see the causes of certain uh, processes. You can also use them as prognostic tool. In other words, if the model represents reality uh, relatively well for today, you can continue to simulate and integrate them and then do a prediction or a prognostic of how things will change in the future. And finally, you can do what I call here what-if scenarios. You can say, what will happen if this happened? You can do a simulation. What would happen if the emission changed? What would happen if the aerosol would disappear from the atmosphere? So there are a lot of things that you can do with your model. And um, in fact, um, we should always remember that they usually are simplified representation of reality. They capture only certain aspect. They simplify reality. They might not be fully objectives because you decide what to put in your model and sometimes you put things that you like to put and not others. They might be somewhat subjective. They might somewhat embellish the reality. And so uh, this is kind of a, a nice discussion that, that we could uh, have in the future. Now, uh, basically, models are used for weather prediction. We know that the weather is not predictable forever, but maybe for something like 2, 15, 20 days. As we do climate, which can be viewed as the average of weather, is climate really predictable? Can we really run models forever and have a prediction? This is, of course, a matter of, debated, of debates. Uh, clearly, we can do prognostic, we can do simulation of what happens. But it is not exactly what's going to happen, since there is always a chaotic uh, dimension in the way uh, our Earth uh, functions. And so basically what we do generally when we do climate models, we do ensemble of models 
starting the models with slightly different initial condition or changing slightly some of the parameters. We might even do multi-model ensemble because we know, as I said, that a model is somewhat uh, subjective and every model is therefore somewhat differently subjective. And if you want to have an idea of the bandwidth of the results, you want to have maybe several models looking at the same problem and you have an idea of the differences that exist and therefore the uncertainty that is associated with your model. So here's an example of, for example, um, well, an ensemble of calculation of precipitation changes in December, January, February in Europe. And if you look very carefully, you will see that each of these uh, uh, realization of this ensemble is slightly different. And in fact, what we will do is the average of those, but also looking at the, the, the variance between the different models that will give you somewhat of the uncertainty. Uh, another example here is, again, precipitation changes uh, for Europe uh, from different models. And you see they all kind of say drier in the south, wetter in the north. But uh, there are quite large differences between what the different models are predicting. And so we should always remember that because when we present model results to an audience, you might be very proud of your own model, but it's only one realization of what happens in this virtual world. You should also care about what other models are uh, presenting and, of course, uh, at the end, show that the projection that you do has some uncertainty associated with it and the communication of uncertainty to policymakers, to people who use the result, is always a very difficult task because they don't expect you to give them uncertainties. They want certainties. They want to know what's going to happen. And you have to say, I cannot do better because of the chaotic nature of the system. So, there are of course different types of models. You will see the physicists, for example, they like to develop conceptual models that really are there to test ideas. And then you have detailed models like the weather prediction model or the chemical model that we like to do where we try to be as close as possible to uh, reality. So to conclude this part, I think what we should say is that simulation modeling represents a way to create virtual copies of the Earth in cyberspace. So these virtual copies, usually done by computers, can be, can be uh, submitted to all kind of forcing experiment without, of course, affecting the Earth itself. And so that's a very interesting tool. You can uh, basically establish, explore a number of uh, variation that happen without creating catastrophic damage to uh, the specimen, to the Earth itself. So here's an example of a model. This is a, <clears throat> the NCAR CAM CAM model showing a representation of ozone concentration at the surface. And you see here the resolution is about 50 kilometer in, in space. And you see, of course, the complexity of what the model can do. Uh, showing, for example, large amount of ozone in, in region affected by precursors, uh, pollutant, but also in the tropics where biomass burning is uh, important. And basically uh, these models, similar models, are used in uh, some of the EU projects like uh, uh, Mac 2 or Mac 1.1, now it's called. Here is the prediction for today, Monday, June uh, 10 of the surface nitrogen oxides, as you can see, a uh, large amount over China. Uh, probably we're okay here in the southern part of France today. That's what ECMWF and, and MAC2 are telling us. You see large amounts uh, uh, over southern North America. You see even the tracks of the ships. So the resulting ozone that is produced photochemically probably is shown here. So today, America is uh, ozone-free almost, very low ozone, North America. But China uh, will have quite a bit of ozone, especially in the south. This is for today, June 10th. Now, gas phase uh, aspect is important. And of course, we saw ozone, NOx, other ones. Aerosol is another issue, and Nicola will talk about it in the afternoon. But here is a model with a 10-kilometer resolution from NASA. 
that shows you essentially uh, in red the dust that is covering kind of the desertic region. You see the effect of smoke over South America, over Africa. The uh, white here is sulfate associated essentially with coal burning. And what is blue is a calculation of the sea salt. And so we can do that and in fact ECMWF will also do a prediction for the aerosol optical depth every day. This is again the prediction for uh, today and you see that there will be quite a bit of dust floating over Africa and uh, in the uh, Middle East uh, in, 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 in part. <coughs> okay, now that we have seen a bit, you know, what a model is and what kind of things we can do with a model, we see it's complex, we're going to go a bit more detail. And so, first of all, what are the different types of models that exist? We will distinguish between what we call Eulerian and Lagrangian models. Now, you know from physics what an Eulerian framework is and what a Lagrangian framework is. If you are along the river, the, the Adua here in the region, you can be on the bank and look at the ship going and passing. And so you're fixed and you see the movement of the ships. But you can also be on the ship itself and then you see the banks kind of passing along you. That's the Lagrangian approach. The first one is the Eulerian approach. And so we do the same thing with the Mars. We can take a box, like the box that is here. This box is fixed, doesn't move. It's a fixed framework and then the flow of material goes through this little uh, parcel. That will be an Eulerian, uh, Eulerian uh, model. And so there we have different models that we can think of. We can take a 0D or a box model where essentially what you're going to do is calculate what happens inside this box through the complex photochemical uh, processes that take place but you will neglect for example transport, you will just assume that the box is, is fixed. Later on you might even say I'm going to have this box moving and see how the evolution takes place. You can have one dimension models where you put let's say in the vertical a number of boxes and you know in the 70s the computers were only able to handle chemistry in one dimensional boxes uh, Later on we started thinking about two-dimensional models and now of course we are talking about three-dimensional models and basically we will replace, we will develop in the space under consideration a grid here in this case a three-dimensional grid and we will calculate let's say the concentration of the species that we are considering at each grid point or Sometimes we'll do an average for each grid box. But uh, we will discretize our problem into a number of boxes. And of course, the more boxes we have, the more accuracy, the more resolution, the more detail we will be able to represent in the model. But at the same time, the price to pay in the computer will increase. So today, we will have to limit generally the resolution and it's a computer that will tell us what uh, is the limit. Simple example of box model, this is a general box model with uh, four boxes that interact uh, and this is in this case a simple representation of the global carbon cycle. You just look at, you know, for example, six gigaton per year of carbon will be introduced in the atmosphere as a result of uh, man-made emission and then what happens, how will that be distributed among the land or the biosphere, the ocean and, and the sentiment and the atmosphere. That's an example. A zero D model is very often used to investigate the chemistry inside an air parcel and really treat the chemistry in a lot of details in such a very small air parcel. It's very fast computationally and you can look at very comprehensive chemical mechanism uh, and of course it doesn't take transport into account. Two dimension models were used a lot in the stratosphere because we wanted to know basically how the chemical species distribute themselves between the equator and the pole knowing that the variation in longitude uh, 
was relatively non-important or less important than it is, for example, in the troposphere. So the earlier stratospheric models were really two-dimensional uh, models. Three-dimensional Illyrian model, this is an example of a regional model over Europe and you see basically um, that on the left it's the model of the poor scientist who has a very small computer, needs to go to low resolution, but if you're a bigger a richer scientist with a better computer, you can start resolving much better and in fact you will usually have thousands of grid boxes so you will have to solve your chemical system at each time, time, time step thousands of times in each of the grid bo box where the solar illumination for example will be different. Lagrangian models, well in this case we're not sitting on a grid and looking how the trace pieces flow along the grid but we are taking an air parcel and we sit on the air parcel you see the air parcel now moves and so we are following essentially in each of the air parcel the evolution of the chemicals <clears throat> you can do a global model you just assume for example that you have 100,000 of these air parcels and you calculate their trajectory and you follow them and as you follow them you look inside these air parcels how the chemistry evolve. The problem with the Lagrangian models when you look at the global scale for example is that you might start with 100,000 air parcels that are relatively uniformly distributed but the dynamics will move them and they might be region where they concentrate a bit so you have a lot of information there and other region of your space where you start to lack some of the air parcels and so you will have very little information and so what you have to do sometimes is remap the results of your air parcels on a grid and start again to use the grid point as initial air parcel to continue and, and redo your Lagrangian. In fact, as we will see perhaps later on, there are intermediate models where you do Lagrangian calculation and you remap on a grid at every time step. These are called semi-Lagrangian models. There are reasons for doing that. We'll talk about it. Okay, let's go now to the fundamental equations. Now, if we do a model, Unfortunately, you know that you need to solve a few of the numerical problems and you have an equation, in fact you will have a system of equation that is pretty complicated to solve. So the first thing we want to do, of course, is to establish the fundamental equation that we will be using. This fundamental equation is called the continuity equation. It is, in fact, an equation that expresses mass conservation. So, let's take a little box like the one that is here, very, very small box, and let's assume that we have a flux, which is called here Fi, in the x direction. So we just assume first it's a one-dimensional problem, the flow goes from left to east, and the flux is, you see, the, the, the size of the box in this direction is dx, very small, so this is the flux at x minus dx over 2, this is the flux over at point x plus dx over 2. So we would like to know when this flux is passing through, does the concentration rho i, y i, because i is chemical compounds number i, so does it change with time due to this flow? And in fact what it is, it is the flux that enters minus the flux that goes out times the area in gray here which is dy dz in fact there is a problem it's dy dz and you have to divide it then by the volume of the box dx dy dz and if you look at this and you assume that the flux is times the concentration times the wind speed u this term here is minus d rho i u over dx, so it is basically um, the change in the concentration 
that you have when the flux goes in this direction. By the way, if the flux is constant, nothing changes, as much comes in, as much comes out, the change in concentration will be zero. But nothing guarantees that the flux will be constant because basically we could have formation in the box, destruction in the box, or we could have fluxes coming from other direction. In fact, this is the 1D representation. Now, if we take it in three dimension, then you have basically the three terms, the terms in the X direction, in the Y direction, in the Z direction, and that's nothing than the divergence of the flux. And so the equation here for advection is shown here or here, but here I've added a, a last term that is a chemical source inside the box. Something can happen in the box. We can produce this compound, I that is passing through, or we can destroy it. So this is the continuity equation that we will deal with. It is an Eulerian view, since uh, basically we are looking at what happens in the box. The box is fixed, and so this is the equation that we will have to s solve. Rho i is the density, the mass density of chemical species i, and v is the vector, the velocity vector, that is the winds essentially. Si is the chemical source term, production minus destruction. So you have to remember this equation. This is the fundamental one, and it's expressed in terms of density. In other words, kilo per cubic meter, a similar equation would be if we uh, were writing particle per cubic meter or per cubic centimeter. By the way, we can also rewrite this equation in terms of mixing ratio. The mixing ratio, as you will hear from others probably, is the density of the species I divided by the air density. So it's a quantity that is always less than one and it is the relative amount versus the total amount of air. So you can put that in your equation and then your equation becomes this one here. So it's d mu over dt plus v gradient mu equal a source term divided by rho a. Now this term here on the left hand is equivalent to what we call the total derivative or the material derivative or the derivative along the flow. And so we write d mu over dt equal si over rho a. What it means is that in the absence of chemical production and destruction term, the mixing ratio is a conserved quantity. If you take an air parcel, now this is important for Lagrangian model, if you know the mixing ratio inside an air parcel, and the air passes moves and goes up and down and left and right and there is no chemical change, no formation, no destruction inside the air parcel, mu will remain the same in your air parcel. Rho will not remain the same. The density, if you take a parcel that goes up, the density will decrease, the mixing ratio will remain the same. So this is very important, the mixing ratio is a conserved quantity and so in the abs absence of local sources the mixing ratio in air parcel is conserved along the displacement of the air parcel and so this is the Lagrangian view and in fact we will use this equation essentially when we do Lagrangian model. We will just take air parcel and let them move, assume the mixing ratio is not changing unless there is chemical production or destruction. Now we're done. We have seen what the continuity equation is and this is the equation that we should solve. <coughs> of course it was a bit simple because you saw basically two terms. One that shows you the advection, that was the transport term, and another term, S, that showed you the chemical production and destruction. Theoretically that's enough. However, as you will see later on, we will have to deal with a lot of issues. First of all, of course, we have the chemistry, and that's okay, that we know, we'll have to deal with it. But once we go to the transport and the advection, unfortunately, it's not as simple as I wrote it there. Why? 
because transport occurs at many, many, many scales. You have the large scale wind, which we call the advection, and that's treated by the divergence of the flux very well. Once we deal with small scale uh, uh, transport and dynamics, for example, turbulence or convection or other kind of mixing that occurs in the atmosphere, unfortunately all that happens at a scale that is much smaller than the grid size of the model. And so the model just doesn't see it. It's happening at a scale that is not resolved by the model. And so we will have to add to the chemistry and the advection some subscale transport issue due to convection, mixing, for example. Then we have other processes, let for example wet scavenging of soluble species, physical processes. It's not chemistry, but basically you capture some of the soluble species and you let them fall in the rain. Scavenging will have to be there, it's here. And finally we have to deal with the changes in the concentration to do injection of material, of chemical species. If an airplane flies and rejects, I don't know, water, CO2 and O2, you have an injection. If you are at the surface, you have emissions, and you'll hear more about this during the school. So the changes of concentration due to emission and also to, wet, to dry deposition on the surface of chemical species. So at the end, to do a complicated model or a comprehensive model, you will have to deal with all these processes, chemical processes, result advection, unresolved tra transport, wet scavenging, emission and dry deposition. So we will go to some of those, not necessarily all, but uh, you will see how complex it is to, to treat them. By the way, when you deal with, aer with aerosols, and you'll hear from Nicola more about it, you have additional physical processes. Now in the case of aerosols, you don't want only to know the mass pro cubic meter, you also want to know the size distribution of these aerosols. And so that creates a complication in the equation. The equation are the same, but you have to deal with, for example, processes like coagulation. Two small particles come together and boom, create a larger particle. So all these processes will have to be taken into account in the continuity equation when you deal with aerosol, especially when you deal with aerosols with uh, size distribution. And you see here, essentially, coagulation is one example, but nucleation, uh, condensation, evaporation, you have all these physical processes that will be discussed, I think, in the afternoon. So I will not say much about them now. Oh, by the way, you saw that in the continuity equation we have the wind. We need to know the wind to transport species. So in some models the wind is prescribed. You know it from, let's say, meteorological observations or meteorological models. But in other models you want to calculate them together with your chemical species. Then you have to add to your chemical model a meteorological model or a dynamical model and you have to solve additional equations. So for example here you will have an, a continuity equation for the air, for the total air, so no chemistry, so it's rho A air. Again the wind appears here, the wind velocity. Then you will have an equation that shows you the momentum, uh, conservation of momentum in a rotating framework, the earth is turning, so you will see here what's called the Coriolis force, the gradient force, the gravity and all kind of other um, uh, small scale uh, viscosity forces and you will have to write an equation for essentially the conservation of energy where T is the temperature which you also need to know of course for, chem for chemical model and Q is the net heating rate that is occurring because of absorption of chemical, uh, by chemical compounds of solar light or emission of uh, infrared uh, 
terrestrial radiation. So the meteorologists will have to deal with that. The uh, equation of state for perfect gas relates pressure, density and temperature. So essentially you will have enough equation to solve the whole system but you see this equation here are extremely non-linear and creates very difficult topics with a lot of scale dependent movement including turbulence and so it's a problem for the meteorologists which we will not discuss here uh, in, in, in this talk. But you see the circulation and you see of course that this circulation will affect the transport of the chemical species that we are interested in. So now we have established the equations. We just need to solve them. But that's not so easy. And so essentially uh, we have to, to represent them. And uh, the analytic solution is not available except in very, very simple cases. I'll show you an example where it's available. <laughs> and of course the equation that you saw, the continuity equation for chemical species, and the dynamical equation for the air that the meteorologists would solve, they have to be solved by numerical method. By the way, when I talk about the continuity equation for chemical species, I show you one equation, but in reality, in a chemical model, I have a lot of chemical compounds, maybe 100, maybe 200, so I will have to solve simultaneously 100 or 200 equation. And my equation that I show is essentially a vector equation. When I say the concentration rho, that's a vector of maybe 100, 200 element, the concentration of each chemical compound. So the equation will be discretized and solved at finite location and finite time interval. That's what the numerical techniques are doing. <coughs> the location can be grid points, I mentioned that, or finite elements, which is the average over a small volume as I showed you earlier. But of course there are other approaches and one of them that was used very much by the climate community is the spectral approach where essentially the, uh, the fields, I call it phi here as, an, as a kind of a quantity, it's a generic quantity that represents a bit everything in, in equations, but uh, we're going to see how we solve these equations for phi and the uh, spectral model in fact expand those phi as a number of waves uh, and uh, do a Fourier analysis of those waves. So let's uh, show an example again of a grid and you see low resolution on the left, higher resolution on the right. This is a bit written in French but you can see typically uh, for cities, for larger urban area, for regions, for land, for continent, for the globe. The typical horizontal resolution that we use today, if you do a city model, you might use five meters because you want to see what happened in a given street. We call it street canyon sometimes. If you do a global model, maybe you'll use a resolution of 200 kilometers today. Well, I showed you better than that. I showed you the ozone with 50 kilometer resolution and the aerosol with 10 kilometer resolution. These are really kind of advanced studies that are made as tests, but typically a global model runs at 100, 200 kilometer <coughs> resolution. A regional model might run today at about um, 10 kilometer uh, resolution or even 3 kilometer resolution. Of course, the number of levels that you will have in the model is also changing depending on the model. And the number of species that you can uh, in implement in your model, you can see here they're talking about 40 to 100. Of course, uh, sometimes now we're trying to put more than that. So I will now pass this part here because I want to discuss it in the uh, working groups. but. One way to express basically any function like pressure, winds, concentration is really to express them as a Fourier analysis, as a Fourier series and then to calculate essentially 
the coefficient a, m, then r there. Basically, what you do in a, in a spectral model, so you express any of your variables as this uh, series here. E here are bases, so you can decide what it is. And basically, you will look for A. Uh, in reality, of course, you do not take an infinite number of waves. You limit your number of waves by M. And so the problem then consists at replacing your equation by a system of algebraic equation and look for the parameter M. Let me show you that in a simple case. Assume that you have here a square function that is shown in black and you can uh, expand this through a number of, you can decompose and take a number of waves and you can see here Y1 which is a, a single sinus wave and then you have Y2, Y3, in fact Y3, Y5. You can add all these waves, in this case you only have Y1, Y3, Y5 and you get this uh, point here dashed line which kind of approximate relatively well but not perfectly your uh, square function as it is here. Now if you want more accuracy you have a y7, y9, you continue and you expand more. You can immediately see that by having here sinus as your base function basically you, uh, you, you simplify your problem because you just you just have sinus, you know how to deal and treat sinus and, and finally get the total here. But you immediately see that your approximation will have some overshoots and undershoots. And so that, for example, very often if, if you have value that are only positive, this is now a wave, so they're positive and negative, but if you had value that are only negative, your representation in spectral model will create negative values. In the concentration of chemicals, this is not something that you wish to have. So we'll look at that in more detail. We're going to pass all this and we're going to go and say another representation rather than taking a nice uh, Fourier decomposition of your signal and a series and having therefore smooth mathematical uh, uh, ways of representing and calculating for example the derivatives in a very analytic way. This has been done by the way a lot by climate models because it had a number of advantages but today the, the trend is to go more to grid point models because of the new architecture of computers that are available and treat uh, needs uh, updated numerical technique. So uh, this is an example of a grid that is used. This is a grid that is latitude longitude grid very often used by models also by chemical transport models. It has one this big disadvantage and the disadvantage is that all the meridians converge here at the pole and so the delta longitude delta x which is relatively large at the equator, gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you get closer to the pole. And many numerical techniques that you will apply will be limited by this uh, issue. If your delta longitude, or delta x, let's call it, becomes too small, your delta t, the time step that you're going to use for the model, will have to be equally very small and so you run very often for many many years so you want a large time step if your time step is limited and you have to take a few seconds as opposed to a few days your computer resources will be uh, well your computer cost will be very high and so these models here uh, are a problem very often in global models and so other grids have been proposed to address the uh, polar problem. One of them is a reduced grid, so you see this grid. Now near the pole, the delta longitude, the delta x, is not smaller than anywhere else. And so some people run, but it's more complicated because it's not just for the discretization, a simple latitude longitude discretization that you have to do. The other uh, issue, for example, the cube sphere, uh, 
This one has no pole, but it has some uh, kind of complicated point here. There are four of them. Introduced, in fact, in France by uh, Sadurni. And uh, what you do then, I'll show you later on. I'll come back to, the, to, this, to this one. Another example is the ecosahedral sphere. These are triangular uh, grids. Uh, people are using this. There's no pole either. But of course, you, you can see the discretization of your complicated equation on such a, a grid is uh, somewhat more difficult. The ocean people, they use a strange grid sometimes that has three poles, one here, one here, one in the South Pole. And since they deal with the ocean, they always work so that the the poles that they have are located over land, so they don't have the equation do not reach this this area. This is uh, the uh, yin yang uh, grid. You cover the Earth by two grids, like this, and then you open them essentially. Um, some people want to use that. The problem is that at some points, like here, you have a double grid, and so you have a double solution. So this is a summary here in a bit. Uh, you see here the grid, the longitude, latitude grid. You see here the, the cube sphere uh, grid. And you see here another icosahedral grid where the grids are now hexagonal. Uh, it's easy to do some, some of the elements though are pentagonal in order to bring everything together. So a lot of people are working now on these new grids. One of the reason to use this grid, this is the icosahedral eco grid uh, spherical, is that you might be able to find regions in your global model where you zoom and have higher resolution. So if you want to know what is the air quality in France or in, in Europe, you might put a grid that has high resolution over Europe, but still some decent resolution far away from the region of uh, interest. Some people now are trying even to have adaptive uh, grids where basically your resolution is not uniform. And uh, if you have like, you know, a front passing through or some very complex behavior of your chemicals, say, or your weather, you might increase locally the resolution in regions where something complex is happening. And these grids then move with, you know, the front moves, the grid moves with the front. So there are people now trying to do that. It is uh, interesting physically because you get a better representation in regions of complexity. But it's much more complicated to manage and it's also expensive from the computing uh, point of view. So we will now start working on some of these issues. And first of all, we will forget about transport, but we will converge on one issue, which is the chemical representation, and see how we can address the chemistry. So chemical systems are assumed to be represented by a system of n uh, nonlinear equations, the continuity equations that I showed you earlier. We have n if we have n chemical species that are interacting. So these equations are not independent. In global chemical models, I say n is typically 100 to 200. But in complex models, box models in particular, the 0D model, you can have more than 1,000 reactions, 5,000, 10,000 uh, reactions. Now, another characteristic of chemical models is that the time constant associated with all these chemicals is very different. Methane, time constant, 10 years. OH, time constant, maybe seconds or minutes. So you will, or if you take O single D, it's even shorter than that. So you have a system that is called to be stiff. In French, you say mal conditionné. It's a difficult system because, as you know, very often, the numerical method, once that you take your time step, delta T, to do the forward integration as small as the smallest time constant in a system. So if I have, let's say, OH and methane, 
And I want to know how my methane, that's destroyed by OH, wants to evolve over the next 100 years. I would like to run that with, you know, methane is a 10-year time step, so maybe I took one year as a time step and go forward. But if I want to calculate OH at the same time, theoretically, in many numerical methods, I would have to take the, life, the, the time step smaller than the lifetime of methane, so maybe a few minutes. And of course, running for methane with a few minutes time step because of the short lifetime of methane is extremely expensive. The system is stiff, and so very often, especially if I have 100 reaction, non-linear reaction in addition, non-linear processes, I will be unstable easily if my time step is too large. So that's a problem that we face as, in particular, the meteorologists don't face that, but the chemical people face this, and so we will have to develop methods that are particularly appropriate for stiff system. Of course, to build my chemical system, I will have to know what chemical scheme I want to adopt in my model. And so this is the first thing I need to do, is to establish a list of chemical reaction that I want to consider in my model. And it's the choice of the modeler to take a lot of them, a few of them. If you want to be accurate, you will have to take more and more, but again, the cost will be higher. This is here an example of a relatively simplified chemical scheme that uh, shows the ozone coming from the stratosphere, producing O single D, OH, OH gets converted in HO2, you get the nitrogen oxide, they are fertilized, they produce ozone, you have emission at the surface from the biosphere, from the hydrosphere, you have sulfur compound, you have deposition, so you have to deal with all that in your model, but at the moment we'll only look at the chemistry and so we will assume that we know what chemi chemical scheme we want to adopt. Normally, Paul Monks will talk more about what is a chemical scheme, what are the important reactions, so we'll wait for him to know exactly what scheme we want to use. But we know that this scheme is stiff, that it has a lot of time step. And I'll show you an example here of a stiff system. This is an example here. The stiffness uh, ratio, R, is 1000. That means that basically we have in this system two time constant. One is uh, 1 over 1000 and the other one is 1. And so here's the system to solve. In this case we know the analytic solution, so we're not really in trouble. And you see the analytic solution. It's an equation for U and V, so two two uh, equations. The solution is shown here and in, blue, in black essentially you have the exact solution. We start with the value uh, of uh, 1 for u and 0 for v. We show here u and this should be the solution. Now we can solve it by a numerical technique. I show you here for example, uh, let's take an explicit implicit, I will define that in a second but you can see that some of the approximation, the numerical approximation, the implicit one, which is in blue, is going to be not necessarily very accurate at the beginning, but will be stable and kind of converge to the real uh, analytic exact solution. If I take what is called an explicit solution and a very small time step, I will do relatively okay, maybe except at the beginning, if I take a longer time step, I will oscillate, but it's okay at the end. If I take a slightly larger time step, I will start to oscillate and I will not be able to find the solution. So these are examples that shows you that in this case, I have to take a solution, that, a time step, that is 1 over 1000, exactly as the smallest of the time constant associated here. I have two time constant, a thousand and one. I would like to use one as my time step. Well, it won't work uh, if I take in particular an explicit solution. So we will see now a bit how we deal with 
implicit, explicit solution and why they stable and unstable. Well, let's assume that my chemical equation to solve, again I have a generic function here phi, that's d phi over dt equal s, s is the source term and of course the source term depends very much on my chemical scheme. In theory this is a vector equation, phi has, it's a vector, if I have 100 species I will have 100 elements in this vector, but we will assume just for our uh, easiness here that it's one compound, s is the source term, we have an, an initial concentration that is specified at times t0. And then I can discretize this equation, it's an equation, it's, 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 a, it's an ordinary differential equation only on time and I can do, I can say that the function at times n plus 1 equal the function at times n plus delta t s the source term. Now I can calculate, I can express my term s at times t n which is known, so I know s at times t n, I'm looking for the solution at times n plus 1, or I can uh, express my solution at times n plus 1, which is unknown, uh, and this is the implicit method. Did you get that? So basically I replace my derivative by phi n plus 1 minus phi n over delta t, and then I rearrange the term, this is the explicit method, this is the implicit method. The explicit method, of course, is much more simple. I can almost by hand calculate the new value of the function. If I know the value at times n, which is uh, here, and it is a straightforward calculation. If I use an implicit method, it's not so simple because now I don't know the term here. It, you see the source term is calculated with the solution at times n plus 1 which is unknown and solving this second equation is much much more complicated. By the way I can also do something in between and say the new value is the old value plus half the time at times n and half the time at times n plus 1. In fact this is sometimes done because it's more accurate. Uh, you, you see immediately that in the first, in the explicit method, basically s, which is the slope of the solution, is estimated times n. If you do an implicit method, you estimate the slope at times n plus 1. And of course, uh, it's different if you do uh, the, uh, this method here, the trapezoidal method, you estimate the slope between uh, A and B here, it's the average slope and it's more accurate. But it is still implicit in the sense that you cannot solve this equation very easy because you don't know this term, it depends on phi at n plus 1. Well, let's look at simple examples between those two methods and we will start with the explicit method which is shown here. And now I will have to take a simple case. I'm assuming that the source term is in fact only a linear loss. So I write my equation d phi over dt equal minus L times phi. L is a constant, it's known. And so I know the solution from this. The, in fact, this is a case where I know the analytic solution. It's shown here. It says that the concentration at a time 10 n plus 1 is equal to the concentration at the times n minus e minus l delta t. That's my exact analytic solution. If I apply now the explicit method, I look for an approximation, which is shown here. So the phi at times n plus 1 equal uh, phi n times 1 minus l delta t. So I have replaced the exponential term by 1 minus l delta t. This is going to be relatively okay if delta t is very, very, very small. In fact, the stability of the solution, we can calculate that, requires that delta t is less than 2 times over L. And you can see if you want to keep the solution positive, 
you have delta t less than 1 over L. So basically, we are bounded, we are limited by L, by 1 over L, which if uh, we have a, a, a species with a very, very short time scale, delta t will have to be smaller than this term. And so the explicit method, as you see here, is simple to, to, to resolve, but unfortunately it only is stable or, or requires essentially that the time step be extremely small, in particular when we have fast reacting species. We can use that if we solve only one species like methane that has 10 years lifetime, you can, you can use that. But if you have species with one minute or one second, you start to be in trouble. So we will then prefer the implicit method. Now the implicit method is shown here again and you see that we take again this linear equation with a source term that is a linear loss. In this case you can show that your solution is this one. So you have approximated the exponential term not by 1 minus L delta T but with 1 over 1 plus L delta T. And this solution is always positive and in fact it is always stable. It brings also a solution that for very large time step are consistent with the analytic solution. In fact, for, so, so it's, it's easier. The trouble is that here it's simple of course to, in this linear case it's, it's simple to solve, but in reality it is more difficult to solve when you have a complex system because you have to invert your system. So if for example you have a source term at t plus 1, so for the implicit method, usually what, you know, in order to solve this, this is very complicated, what you do, you linearize your equation, like here, j is called the Jacobian, and then you find at the end a solution that is like this, and you can see i is the identity matrix, j is the Jacobian matrix, which is a matrix where all the elements are the derivative of the source divided by the concentration and in fact you have to invert this matrix here and inverting a matrix is time consuming. Now we have a stable solution, we have of course linearized which uh, introduce of course some kind of inaccuracy but we have again something difficult to learn. And so just to, f this is my last slide for this morning, the comparison between fully explicit and fully implicit method highlights the advantage and the advantage of both approaches. Fully explicit are usually simple to solve, but stability consideration constrain the integration time step to very, very small value. The algorithm may become so inefficient that the method is often impractical. In addition, the positivity of the solution is not guaranteed. It may, however, be adequate for longer-lived species like methane, CO2, etc. Fully implicit solvers are unconditionally stable, they're always stable, so that the time step can be large. It's usually limited, of course, by accuracy requirement. If you take a too large time step, it's not going to be very accurate. However, they require the solution of a system of algebraic equation at each time step, involving in general the construction and inversion of a Jacobian matrix. This can limit the size of the chemical mechanism, because it becomes very difficult to solve. The matrix might become large. It's a matrix n over n. n is the number of chemical species. And usually you have to limit the number of coupled chemical species in the system if you want to have a Jacobian that is not too large and not too difficult to invert. So this is where we are today. Um, tomorrow we'll look at other uh, equations you see that none of the two are satisfactory. One is limited by the time step, the other one is limited by the size of the Jacobian. Both create a, require a lot of computer resources and that's one of the reasons why the chemical models are so expensive to run. So we'll have to think about it and find out ways maybe to find methods that are faster and not so uh, limited as the one the simple one that I just showed you. Thank you.